Say hello. It's uh, really great to be in Newcastle. I, I normally start talks by saying how nice it is to be in a city I've not been to before, but I'm actually a Geordie. Um, the accent is going further south. The longer I live down there, I've been down in the south for about 18 years. Um, but I was born and brought up in Newcastle, so it's been really great to be back and having a wander around and see what's changed, because the, the key sign means is just fantastic. So I'm here, and I'm going to talk about something that I spend a lot of my time doing and thinking about, and that is technical support. I've been a front and back end developer for something about like 16 years, and I've run my own business since 2001. And for almost four years, we've had a product, Perch, which kind of started off as a little side product, um, and something that we were just doing as, you know, that was bringing in a little bit of extra money. It's now actually all that we do. So we spend our time developing and supporting Perch. I'm not here to sell you Perch, but I do need to tell you a little bit about it so that you can understand the context of, of the rest of this, this talk. So Perch is self-hosted. People buy it, and they download it, and they install it on their own hosting, and they install it on their own local development environments. That's kind of important in terms of how much support we have to deal with. And it's written in PHP and MySQL. The target market is web designers. We're not selling this to kind of end clients. We expect that people have you know, some kind of technical ability when they buy it. So when I talk to my peers about Perch, or I talk to people like you guys, and I say, you know, well, we used to be a services business, and now we do this product, people are like, wow, I'd love to be doing that. You know, no more clients, a, a, a product, that sounds great. And then they say, but what about all the support you must deal with? So I talk about support a lot, which is why I came up sort of with this, this idea for a talk, because at every conference I go to, I'll be talking about something else. I'll be talking about CSS or whatever. But afterwards, in the hallway, people asked me about the technical support for Perch. So I thought, well, let's talk a bit about that and the things we've learned. Um, because even four years on, and the fact that Perch is all that we do, and we've got an awful lot of customers, it's still just Drew and myself doing all the support. Uh, so we've had to kind of find ways to manage that. And we've also learned quite a bit about how to get support. Because I don't think it's obvious, unless you've supported a product, actually how to really form a support request and how to ask for support in a way that will get you help quickly. You know, we see an endless stream of very intelligent people coming into support and asking us questions um, that we can't really answer. We have to ask them a bunch of questions back and this thing goes on for ages and they can't get back to their project uh, because we're having to have to sort of tease out the information that we need to be able to help them. So I'm going to talk about the business of supporting people and how we do that and a, and a bit about how you might get support and get better support. So in our experience with Perch, the support that we offer for the product is possibly as important as the features of the thing itself. When we look on Twitter and you know, sort of see what people are saying about us, a lot of the stuff we're seeing is actually about the support. It's about what people think about the help they're getting. And we see some really nice tweets from people. So support can be an amazing marketing tool, especially like us. You know, we've got a, a product that's aimed at people who use it for their business. They're using it to provide services to their clients. So it's really, really valuable to them that we're going to help them out and that they know that they're going to get help. So support is a really, really good marketing tool. People talk about good support. And the level of help we're giving people and the speed of our response is really important because we're a commercial product in the CMS space. And there's a ton of free content management systems out there, obviously. So what, you know, what makes us different? And one of the things that makes us different is that we help people. And we really, really help people. So I think sometimes, and I think quite often actually, the fact that people will get support is what makes them buy Perch the first time. You know, they think, well, you know, this, this is an important project, and I'm a bit worried, will I be able to do this? And they know they're going to get help, so maybe they'll buy that first license. And, you know, we see that a lot, people saying, oh, well, you get help, you know, you get support, it's worth paying for. So support is important, and I'd say it's actually vital to the success of Perch. It's been vital to allowing us to become a product business at all. So what tools can, can help you with support? There's a bunch of stuff out there. Um, you know, sort of support desk systems and, and ways to manage support. First, I say the email, using email for support. If you've got a, a 
product, or even just a small project, even just a side project that you're sort of putting out there, supporting it by email is really, really difficult. Um, for us, there's two of us doing support, and we've got this, we've got an email address, hello at grabaperch.com, which kind of pre-sale stuff comes into. And both Drew and I pick that email up. And what we find is that if I've read the email, I've seen it, I've not answered it yet, and then kind of it just disappears in all the other email. And we both think that the other's answering it, or sometimes we'll both answer an email at the same time. Um, if we were doing that for all of our support, it would be an absolute nightmare. Email's really hard to scale as well as a system. Because even if it is just you, if you've just launched something, it's just you supporting, you think, well, email's fine, because it's only me. If your product starts to grow um, and become more successful, and you need to bring in other people to help you, um, the last thing you need to be doing at that point is trying to implement some kind of support system. It's kind of best to be doing that while you're still small, figuring out the best way to offer support and to respond to people. So I'd suggest looking at better ways to do support than just you know, hitting reply on emails really from early on. Support systems do other really useful things. Um, this idea of canned responses. As we'll see later, we spend a lot of our time actually sort of saying the same things over and over again. Um, so people will get in touch and they don't give us their diagnostics report, so we have to say to them, please, can you show us your diagnostic report, which is on, on the settings page in Perch. Now, we could type that out over and over again, but actually it's, it's easier if you've got a way of just doing that with one click and then you can get that turned around quickly. So canned responses are a useful feature of support systems. Something that's probably less obvious is that a decent support system will also give you data. And I'll show you some of our data later, but if you can collect data on what support is coming in, that allows you to plan for future growth. Because if you know that a certain number of your customers will ask for support, or a certain number of your customers will repeatedly ask for support, you can see what the curve's likely to be. And you can also see if you add something to your product or your, your service or whatever that causes lots of support to come in, because you can see those spikes. And you can start to plan for adding more people or how you're going to sort of remove some of the, that support by you know, better materials or whatever. So collecting data is something I hadn't really thought about until we had a system that gave us data. And actually, you know, that, that's really quite useful. So this is the system we use. It's called HelpSpot. It's developed by a company called Userscape. And they're another sort of small product company. And so it's quite cool helping them out and using their software. So it gives us a ticketing system and support forums, and we host it ourselves, which we kind of like, because we don't like that reliance on somebody else's servers being there. Um, and, and we've been able to do our own sort of templates and things for it, so it looks like our documentation system, and we kind of like that as well. It lets us manage tickets, so we can claim them, so that Drew and I don't both answer the same support request. And we can see what's outstanding. And also, customers can reply via the web but crucially, they can reply by email. Because I think, actually, although email isn't a great method for me to deal with support, it's often a good method for people to contact support because they know about email. And they can just reply and attach things or whatever, and that's all fine. It lets us do things like add those kind responses. And it gives us some stats um, and you know, interesting graphs and information about the amount of support that's coming in. Now, we, when we moved to HelpSpot, we did actually look at quite a lot of other systems. Um, there's loads of things. This is uh, Zendesk, which is really popular. That's a software as a service um, support system. We actually very nearly went with Zendesk. And the reason we didn't was because they didn't really support uh, having code in responses very well. Of course, as a CMS, most of our support tickets, we have to apply by you know, giving people some template code or a PHP function or something that they need. Um, that didn't really um, come through very well with Zendesk at the time. I did actually speak to someone who said that they've changed that and it, it is improving. Um, so you need to assess these solutions based on what you need. I think you know, Zendesk had great features, you know, lots of social media features, oh, look, that looks great. But there was that one thing about code and tickets that you know, was the deal breaker. So it's worth having a, a good look at these different systems, because changing support systems can be quite an upheaval for, for your customers as well if they're used to dealing with one thing. So I mentioned social media with Zendesk, and, and they have tools to help you do that. But I think social media is just really important for support. And we see that with, with companies like uh, T-Mobile here. Now, I have a T-Mobile account. I never, ever call them if I have a problem. I tweet them, because they reply to their tweets, and they have people on Twitter who can actually do stuff. 
Um, and it's much easier because I can just tweet them and 30 minutes later or whatever, they get back to me and they direct message me and I send them some details and they sort me out. Great, you know, I don't have to pick up the phone and, and call them. And they're, you know, they're more responsive. So, you know, these big companies are putting an awful lot of work into social media. And that's something that us as kind of geeks and people who already work on the web and already use Twitter have already got that. We've already got that relationship with people on Twitter. So it's a, a kind of a nice way to talk to people. And, you know, we can, we can get back and we can give people a link to the documentation. What it's not good for is in-depth technical support. I can't help someone with their template on Twitter um, in 140 characters. It would take a very long time. Um, but, you know, what I can do is get back and say, oh, you know, here's, here's a link to the documentation. Or just say to them, hey, yeah, that's a great question. Could you post the forums? I'll give you a proper answer there. So they know that you're around. I've seen companies in our space sort of declare that they won't do any support on Twitter. They won't answer questions on Twitter. And I kind of think that's a missed opportunity because Twitter's been one way we can kind of put a friendly face on, on Perch from the sort of company account. You know, so if people ask us a question or we just see someone saying, oh, does anyone know how to do this in Perch? We can reply and say, oh, yes, you know, we've got some docs here or, you know, come into the forum, we'll help you out. They know that there's, there's someone there behind the product and someone who's happy to help them. Twitter's just so visible. And so if potential customers see that questions are answered, then they know that you're there to answer. And as I said before, support is a fantastic marketing tool. And people, just other people who aren't already your customers, seeing that you're helping people is incredibly powerful. So if you're a geek and you've built a product, actually researching support systems and deciding how you're going to support it is probably the easy bit. You know, we, we can all decide which bits of software to use and things and, and make lists and decide which comes to the top and try them out. And that's kind of the easy bit. Custom support involves dealing with customers. And, you know, when you move from being a services business, when you maybe deal, I mean, we did big projects, we maybe dealt with four or five customers in a year, and we moved from that to dealing with thousands of, of customers, thousands of, of people contacting us and, and wanting things. Um, that's a bit of a shock, especially if you are, you know, a sort of slightly socially awkward geek and would rather not speak to anybody. To have to spend all day talking to people is, is a, a little bit of a surprise. Now, our customers are lovely, generally. We, you know, we've got a really, really nice bunch of very enthusiastic customers. Um, they support what we do. They're a real joy to deal with. But you know, it's impossible to not have to deal with some tricky situations when you're supporting a product, and particularly when it's your own product and you're kind of emotionally invested in it. So our first customers knew us, and that made quite a difference in how people interacted with us. Our initial, uh, we didn't really do any proper marketing when we started. We just kind of talked about Perch on Twitter. So all of our first customers were people who knew of us for whatever reason. Maybe they'd read one of my books, or they'd seen Drew talk at a conference, or whatever it was, they knew us. Um, or, they, or they were kind of one step removed. They knew someone who'd recommended us. As the product has kind of spread out, we now have a whole bunch of customers who don't know us. They've got no personal knowledge of Drew or myself, or the sort of people we are, or whether we care or don't care. They're just buying a product. And quite often, they just assume we're the support reps. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be talking to someone in support and they'll say, oh, could you pass this on to the developers? And I'll be like, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but it's, you know, there's not that closeness and that does sort of make it a bit different. And you have this concept of, you know, the customer should always be right. And a lot of our customers think that they are very definitely right. Um, I was uh, listening to the Bootstrapped podcast, um, which is uh, from Ian Landsman and Andrei Butov. Uh, Ian does the HelpSpot software that we use. Um, and that's a really good podcast for people who are creating their own sort of bootstrap products like, like we did. Um, but they were talking about this issue, you know, is the customer always right? And uh, uh, Andre works in the mobile space creating apps. So he was talking about the issue of support for mobile apps that, you know, cost someone 99 cents or whatever. And he said he was getting support tickets that are nothing short of extortion. Because something I hadn't really thought about, you know, we sell a, a low-cost product, but we're not you know, in the app stores and things. Um, people will say, well, if you don't add these features, then I'm going to give you a one-star review. And that review system, of course, really drives whether people buy your product from the app stores. 
um, you know, wow, I'm, yeah, I'm really glad that we're not in that game and we're not in that space because that's a really hard way to sort of compete and people saying, well, if you don't change the color of this or you don't do that, um, I'm going to give you a one-star review. And that's really hard. Because feature requests um, come up in support a lot. You know, a lot of our support is actually people saying, well, I want Perch to do this or that. And that's great in an awful lot of ways. Uh, the development and direction of Perch has been massively led by what the customers have asked for. When we first launched, we were essentially a content editor. We had no ability to add new pages. Um, you know, we didn't have an API at the time. It was a very, very limited little content editor. And we didn't really see a need for it to add new pages. We thought people would build their site, let people edit stuff. But then there was this kind of overwhelming demand for people wanting something a bit more than that. And so we, you know, we built on it and we created all sorts of functionality. And, and Perch 2 actually is able to manage far bigger sites than anything we ever managed that managed Perch 1 would do. So the more you talk to people, you know, you can kind of see the path and the roadmap. And, and people often say, well, what is the roadmap for Perch? And we say, well, we kind of know what we're going to be doing in the next month, but then we're going to see what the feedback is to that and, and see well, as we move on, we um, recently launched a members app, which is essentially for people to be able to do logging in at the front end and, um, say, downloading PDFs or accessing secured content and things. Now, that was never something that we would have thought was a perch thing, but it became the sort of top request. So we're always getting, you know, information from people. What do they want? What can we build? What can we do that's going to make people happy? However, while you're doing that, you have to be really, really careful because you've got to protect the core use case of your product. It's really easy to say yes to every request that comes in. Oh, yes, we can do that. You know, it's just code. We'll write that. Um, and if you're doing client work, that's kind of OK, because you're just building one thing. You know, and, and so it's fine to say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I can code that, and there it is. But if you're adding stuff to your product, it's a whole different ballgame, because you could quite easily end up with a product that is you know, bloated and unusable. And in our case, it would have become the sort of thing we built Perch to get away from entirely. So the core use case of Perch. Basically, you should be able to add a, the include to the runtime, add a Perch region, reload your page in the browser. That region shows up in the admin. You can choose a template, get editing. That is the core basic use case. That's not changed since launch. That's not changed as we went to the second version of the product. That's just how Perch works. But our customers, they really, really want to mess around with that Perch content. They want to add stuff. They want to add all kinds of things. They want to be able to predefine templates, specify sort order, add UI buttons, all sorts of things directly from that tag. Now, we've got ways of doing that stuff. Uh, Perch is template driven. Um, but customers see that tag as being the place where they should add stuff. And if we added all our requests, it would soon become very, very complicated just to get Perch onto your page. Now, in terms of generating regions, uh, doing things programmatically, we've got a way to do that. Uh, Drew thought of a way to, to do that separately so that for most of our customers, that basic use case is fine. They don't need to know about the more complex stuff that we, they can also do. So you know, people will come in and they'll ask for things. And often, the way they ask for things is quite simplistic. They've got an idea of how the product works and how they would add to it if they were writing the code. Um, it's really important to think, well, what is the core use case of this, this product, and how do I protect that while still giving people what they want? But however hard you try to meet the needs of people, and however hard you try to give people what they want, there's always going to be someone who is accusing you of not listening because you haven't added their very, very specific feature request. Um, you know, we get a whole ton of stuff in, and some of it is incredibly specific. And we can't find a, you know, a good way to make that a generic thing that could be useful to more people. And we've got to decide not only how not to bloat the product to make it just unusable, but also where's worth putting development time in. You know, what will benefit the majority? And what will benefit the most people uh, when we add it? You know, you're not fulfilling the request of that noisy person often because you are listening. You're listening to the majority. And the majority are often quite hard to listen to because they tend to be quiet. You know, you don't hear from people who are happy. If people are happy, they're just getting away. They're, they're doing their projects. You know, you might see on Twitter, oh, look, I've just launched this with Perch. That's great. 
but you don't hear from them because they're happy. And so it's really easy to think, oh, everybody's asking for this one thing, we should develop it. And actually, it's a tiny percentage of the customers who want that one thing. And is it the best place for us to spend our time? So support can be essentially free market research. People tell you what they want in support. Or they kind of come in with support requests where you, can, where you realize that actually life would be so much easier for people if the product worked a slightly different way. And so you can kind of gauge that from support. So log the feature requests. And log the places where you have to say no. You know, the, when, when you sort of say, oh, you know, I'm sorry, we, we don't do that. You know, write those down. Keep, keep a record of them somewhere. See if patterns are starting to emerge. Um, you know, see if a change in what's out there on the web. Now, we added some stuff to um, support responsive design, responsive images, because we were starting to see people saying, oh, you know, how do we do this in Perch? Um, you know, or you know, how do we serve uh, retina images? So we added support for that. So it's, it's kind of seeing what the trends are out there and seeing if you can start bringing that into the product. And, and support's a good place to start seeing that. But make sure you don't take the product away from a core use case that's working for the majority because of some noisy people. It does feel incredibly tough if you're accused of not listening, especially when you spend all day listening, essentially, in support. And it's extra tough when it's your product. I think if you're a kind of paid support person and you, you know, you've got that distance between the code and the thing itself and what you're being asked or somebody saying, oh, you're not listening, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not helping me because you won't do this thing. Um, you know, for us, it's, we're quite emotionally invested in Perch. We love Perch. And we, we want people to have a good experience with it. Um, and it can be quite tough when someone is saying, you know, well, you're not helping me. You're, you're, not, you're not doing anything. And, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of hard. And I think having that distance, you know, stepping away from the computer and saying, OK, you know, I just need to get away from this bit before firing back a, a angry response, that's kind of important. It's OK that your product isn't for everyone or for every possible task. That's OK. And trying to make it so, you'd probably end up with a pretty crap product at the end. Um, so sometimes you just have to sit there and say, yeah, it's OK. It's not helping this person, because what they've got isn't really what we're doing. So one of the questions I get asked a lot when I talk to people about support is, you know, don't you get swamped with tickets? As I mentioned, you know, we have web designers use our our product and the level of knowledge amongst our customers is you know huge the, the sort of dis difference between them we have people who really can barely write HTML and CSS you know they're using maybe they're using Dreamweaver or some other website builder thing and their knowledge of even just HTML is quite sketchy right through to experienced PHP developers who use perch kind of as a an add-on to some other system they're doing. They use it for the content management bits. So there's this huge range of people who come into support for various reasons. Um, now, on the end of people who don't know a lot of HTML and CSS, that's where we sort of get these people who we do sometimes feel a bit like we're building their website one ticket at a time. Uh, as they come and say, how do I do this? And we say, oh, like this. And how do I do that? And, and a lot of it actually is HTML and CSS questions, not really anything to do with Perch. But they're there and they need help. And so generally, we help those people. Because as it happens, there aren't that many of them. Uh, I mentioned about the stats in our, our system and how that gives us information. Well, I, we ran some stats before, before I came down here well, you know, to, to put into this presentation, and it was quite interesting. So 26% of customers have raised a ticket, one ticket. 26% of customers. Only 10% have raised more than one ticket. 25% of requests are from the same 50 people. It gets better. 15% from the same 20. 10% come from the same 10 people. One customer brings us 2% of requests, and I know it's nobody here, because I wouldn't have put it on the slide. <laughs> So and it's interesting, actually, just talking about this, Drew and I, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about this, and, and we, we, we know those people, you know, we know the 10%. Um, and, they, you know, they're great people, and actually, some of those people have got a lot of licenses. It's not just that they're, you know, spending a very long time building one website. Um, but that shows that, you know, there's not this problem of masses of people swamping us with tickets. Um, there's a very long tail of customer support. Um, the long line represents those customers who only ask one thing. Um, 
So yeah, it, it's not that isn't our, what happens really. You know, we do get some people who we know very well; they're like our best friends, and uh, and we get other people who we don't ever see. Um, as I say, you know, the, the the majority of people are completely silent. We know they're using the product. We sort of see their sites, um, but we just don't see them in support. We never never hear from them. So sometimes the difficult customer. It's just a customer with different ways of interacting, or perhaps using English as a second language, and we have a lot of that. Um, so sometimes, in, you know, translated English can come across perhaps a bit rude or, or just difficult to understand. Um, web designers tend to have fairly good English because they need it to be able to to uh, do their job really, to be able to get you know, sort of materials and things. But how they act, that actually comes across can be a bit strange. And we've got a, a story about. I don't actually think this customer was using English as a second language, but she certainly was very confused with what we said to her. So Drew was, was talking to this customer, and she was confused about some aspect of the software, and Drew referred to the mental model of, of you know, how to sort of visualize something, how, how things worked. And this made her furious. And Drew couldn't understand why the customer was furious, and so he said, so I read the thread, and I'm like, well, I don't know. Turns out, the customer thought Drew was calling her a mental model. <laughs> I mean, maybe she was a model. We don't know. We don't tend to call our customers names. But it's this sort of baffling, you know, this thread, and you're wondering why this person is so angry with you. And I think that happens quite a lot. And that's an extreme example. But that happens quite a lot. I think sometimes, you know, someone comes in, you think, this person's really angry with us. What have we done? And it's just, you know, it's trans translating from another language, and they just come across as very short. And people often think I'm being, because I, you know, I tend to hammer my emails at high speed, and people say, oh, you know, have I upset you? And I'm like, no, no. And it's, it's just that interaction. And that happens a lot, I think, in support. You know, you're trying to get through a big queue, and you can come across a bit sort of short and, and cross and fed up, and really, you're just trying to be efficient. Um, so that, and that comes across badly. It's, it's, it's a difficult thing. I don't think we always get it right. You know, as I say, we, we sometimes upset people w without realizing it. And it's, you know, it's, I think it's been very interesting. I've, I didn't used to travel a lot. In the last year, I've done quite a lot of traveling and speaking and actually talking to people from different countries and hearing how their English comes across actually helps you to sort of see, you know, how different we interact. Um, and it makes it easier when I then read that English in support. I go, oh, yes, you know. This person is, is, is German, and, and their English comes across in a different way, or whatever. That's quite interesting. And it's not just language. You know, culturally, the expectations are very different. And when you sell a digital product, you become an exporter, legally, and also you know, with having to deal with people from day one. Big companies don't deal with export rules until they're huge, and they've got different people to do that. You know, as a geek selling a, a bit of software, you're selling it all around the world. Um, and that's something you don't really think about until you're suddenly selling your software all around the world and you're dealing with VAT in different countries and you're dealing with people who don't speak English very well and you think, wow, you know, this isn't what I thought I was getting into when I decided to sell this bit of software. So people are always going to need help. Um, that's not, not going to change. Some people don't want to read anything. Some people just get confused by things that, that don't confuse other people. But to some extent, you can design support out of your product. So I've got a little example here. Um, this is the Perch login screen, as, as was. It's actually a Perch 1 login screen. Um, when someone logs into admin Perch, it does a check that Perch is registered against that domain. Um, and people can set up um, staging and, and live domains for each license. So our original messaging just said, sorry, your license key isn't valid for this domain. And the person would then come into support. So we changed it. And we changed it just to give them an instruction what to do. So people knew what to do when they saw the message, and we didn't get any more support requests about it. So if a lot of people are contacting you about the same thing, there really ought to be something you can do to fix it. It's tempting just to stick things in an FAQ. However, if you do that, you end up with a huge FAQ, and that isn't useful to anyone. You know, if you can actually fix the issue in the product, then the support just goes away. Sometimes people need help, and they need it in different ways. We've got a load of documentation, and it has to serve everyone. It has to serve that person who can barely write HTML right through to the person who is an experienced PHP developer. Um, now, the documentation often isn't the best thing for someone who's pretty new to installing a content management system. So we put out a bunch of videos. The video is massively successful. Um, a lot of support requests don't come in anymore because people go and find the videos. 
And if we do get people in saying, how do I install? I'm having problems installing. We say, have you watched the video? They say no. They go watch the video, and they're sorted, and they're up and running. So providing a variety of help materials, uh, different levels and formats, is really, really useful. It has to be said, videos take ages to make. They're really boring to make. They take ages to do all the, all the things, and then you have to edit them. But I've got a 15-year-old daughter. And she's brilliant at editing videos. So that's what she does. She uh, earns some money by editing our videos. So we, we should be doing more of those. But they are quite time consuming to, to prepare. Another thing that is useful to start thinking about is predicting when you're going to get busy. Uh, as a small company, it would be a really bad idea for us to do something that's likely to generate a bunch of support and then go to a conference. Um, because then there's going to be a load of people trying to get in touch, and we're away and dealing with that over Wi-Fi. This graph, you can see the peak there um, of support requests. The peak there is just after we launched Perch 2. And of course, people were trying to upgrade, and it went vroom. And you can see it starts to drop down as the product gets more mature. Uh, it settles down. We found that doing frequent smaller releases also helps, because there's not so much that's new to baffle people. But what is interesting is looking at um, a graph of license sales in red there compared to support tickets in blue. So that despite the fact that we're selling more copies of Perch, and the spikes are where we'd have sort of sales or discounts and things like that, um, we're selling a lot more copies. The support's actually going down as we're managing to find ways to reduce support. Something that's sort of come up that's quite interesting is, is what we refer to as the end client problem. Now, this has only really started to happen in the last year. And what's happening is that people who have had a site built with Perch They've lost contact with their designer, and the end client has discovered that, oh, yes, it's come from these people, and has contacted us for help. Um, this normally shows up. We get a support request that's something like, you know, how do I add an image to my About page, or I can't log into my Perch, and you're thinking, yeah, this probably isn't a designer who's built something with Perch. And we had, you know, so sometimes it's people have fallen out with their designers, but we had one end client get in touch because their, their designer had sadly passed away and they were trying to you know, get their licenses and things sorted out so they could carry on their business. And it, so people lose touch with their designers for all sorts of reasons. Some of them are because their, their designer doesn't want to work with them anymore, but there's all kinds of reasons. And this causes all sorts of problems with third-party software. You know, who owns the license? Our contract is with who, the person who bought it. Maybe that's not the end client. So that's, that's a bit tricky to deal with. And ultimately, who supports the end client who's got a third-party CMS? You know, we're not set up to support end users. We support web designers. Um, the legal issue, I mean, we have to just get them to get the license transferred. The support issue, the way we've really solved that is through our registered developer program. These are a bunch of people who know Perch well. They're listed on the site. We get an end client in saying, I need a new web designer. You know, I've, I've lost contact with my person. We say, hey, we've got a bunch of people here who know Perch well, and they'll be able to help you. So that helps everyone. It helps us, because that end client carries on using Perch. It helps our registered developers, who are customers of ours, because they get another client. Um, you know, and it helps the client out, because they've got someone who knows the software that they're already using. It has to be said that not all support is your problem. And this is the hardest support to deal with. As I said at the start, Perch is self-hosted. So we see all sorts of uh, web hosting that's out there. And quite a lot of it is utterly terrible. You know, we've become expert in the bizarre ways it's possible to configure PHP and MySQL. And there are an awful lot of very odd ways to do it. Um, as, as we hear more from different hosts, you know, we, we try and find out which host someone's using if they're having a specific problem, because then when someone else comes in, we can say, oh, yes, you're on this host. Um, here's some advice for you. But what's even harder are those hosts that refuse to support their own customers, because then the customer kind of ends up in this to and fro between us and the hosting company. Once you suspect that a user has a hosting problem rather than a perch problem, um, we give them copy and paste information to give to the host, you know, so they can just paste it into their support ticket to their host. You know, is there anything I need to do to configure PHP sessions, for instance? And then if the host comes back with a response that they don't understand, they put it back into our system, and then we can help them do that in Perch. Um, but then sometimes you get a host who will just go, well, we don't support third-party scripts. You're like, OK. And this usually is because it's very cheap hosting. 
and it's so oversold, there's no way they can support anybody because they've just, you know, they're, they're charging two ninety nine a month or something. You know, if you're only paying the price of a cup of coffee for your hosting, it's probably fairly terrible um, because they just haven't got the time to support anyone. Cheap hosting works out very expensive in terms of your time. And, you know, a small amount of extra money on hosting, not a lot. You know, a few quid extra a month makes a huge difference in our experience, you know, from what we're seeing in support. The other thing that isn't our problem is people not understanding HTML and CSS. We get this, you know, Perch isn't adding paragraphs. We get this sort of request all the time. And every time Perch is adding paragraphs, the customer has added a reset style sheet at some point, and that is removing the padding and margin on the paragraphs, and so they're not seeing them when they look at their web page. And they presume this is the software. Now, I'm assuming that everyone here understands what a reset style sheet does. But I think actually taking that a little bit further, having some understanding of the full stack that your sites live on you know, makes a huge difference. That doesn't mean becoming a PHP developer if you use software written in PHP, but just understanding kind of how it works, how it all fits together. Uh, people really struggle when they just don't have that mental model of, of how things fit together. These days, you know, you can offer clients a very advanced level, you know, of functionality without actually having to write any back-end code. And I think that, you know, that sort of means there are a lot of people out there who are doing stuff, and then when they get stuck, they get really stuck because they've not really got that, un that understanding. And seriously, you know, if you've been able to learn CSS, CSS is hard, and dealing with browsers is hard. And if anyone's managed to learn CSS, then they're absolutely are capable of learning some PHP or Ruby or something, and just understanding the full stack a bit more. And I think it really pays dividends. Um, you know, those of our customers who just understand a little bit of what's happening underneath their website, find it so much easier. So I've talked a lot about how to do support and the things we've learned while supporting our customers. And, and I hope that you know, if you're thinking of going into the product business, that some of that's useful. But what have we learned about getting support? An awful lot of requests that come into the perch system basically say, you know, help, it's not working. And you know, what do we do about that? We ask them what's not working. Um, because here's the thing, if several thousand people are using a product and the support forums aren't full of angry people, it's working for most of them. So obviously, you know, what you're doing is, is something that's slightly different. It doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. It might be you're doing something that's slightly unusual that we haven't come up against yet. Um, and so, you know, it's really hard for anything to be completely bug free. Uh, but, you know, you need to give some information. Things tend not to be just broken. And that, you know, whether you're heading into support for a product you're using, or you're going into somewhere like Stack Overflow and you're going to post a, some request for help with CSS or whatever, the more information you can give about the particular environment that your code's running in, the easier someone can help you. And in fact, in a sort of free support forum for some open source software or, you know, on Stack Overflow, kind of those quick wins are the questions everyone wants to answer. You know, if someone's given all the information, you can read down and say, oh, yes, I know what that is, and answer it. Well, that's great, because you feel good you've answered someone's question. The question where you know you're going to have to tease out information, they're not so fun to answer, because you know it's going to take you all day. You know, generally, once you can reproduce an issue, it's well on the way to being solved. And that's the key, really, for any support, is how can it be reproduced? If it's a CSS issue, how can I actually see it on my screen? Um, you know, if it's something in Perch, then I'm going to need their template, or I'm going to need the things that they are using to get to that point. There's another thing that's really important to know. What did you expect to happen? To say, most sort of bugs that people encounter aren't actual bugs that just throw an error. What they are is you thought that doing this would cause one effect, and another effect happened. So when you sort of, if someone comes into support and say, well, it's doing this, and we'll go, well, yes, because that's how we wrote it. That's what it does. Because we don't know the important bit of information that they thought it did something else. Um, and so, and that sometimes might mean that we're saying, oh, we know, in Perch, you do it like this. We get a lot of people who use WordPress, and they're trying to use sort of WordPress ideas in Perch, which isn't WordPress. So, you know, it, sometimes it's just a case of saying, ah, yes, well, this is how we do, do it. And um, if we know what they expected to happen, then we can guide them in the right direction for what they need, uh, rather than just saying, well, yes, that's kind of how it works. We wrote it. That's what it does. In general, using software correctly, getting websites um, up and running, isn't about luck. 
And yet we get an amazing number of responses to us asking people to try things, um, and they'll sort of just say, no luck. So if you've been asked to try something by us, or anyone in support, or someone on Stack Overflow, or on a mailing list or whatever, if they ask you to try something and it doesn't work, actually saying what it did do, even if that is absolutely nothing, you know, no, there was no change from the previous state, it's worth saying that. In our case, as people supporting our product, we'll continue to help. You know, so someone will say, no luck, and then we'll say, well, so what did happen? Did anything happen? And so it goes on. Um, but if you're dealing with someone on a, you know, a, a free forum or a mailing list or whatever, then that's kind of where threads get dropped. You know, they say, can you try this? They say, no, look. And the person says, well, I can't be bothered anymore. And, and, and it gets dropped. So I think that actually engaging and saying, you know, well, I've, I've tried this, there's definitely no error, I've checked in the error log, that didn't help. It, it just gets that, that dialogue going and it makes it an awful lot easier. So the perfect support request. Based on, you know, what can we answer? If I wake up in the morning, there's 20 support requests come in overnight from Australia and wherever. You know, which ones can, can we answer really, really quickly? Give versions of the software. And if, you know, if, if, so if you're using some third-party software, which version are you using? Are you up to date? Um, and, and have you upgraded to the latest version if there is one that you can do? Because sometimes that might just fix your problem. Include any diagnostic information if that's available. Um, you know, in Perch we have a diagnostic report. It gives us all sorts of information about people's systems, but people don't give it to us, so then we have to ask for it. Give step-by-step -step instructions to reproduce. That's obviously easier if it's like a CSS problem. That's often quite straightforward. You know, you can set up um, something on, on CodePen or JS Fiddle or something to, sh to show it. Uh, but step-by-step -step instructions, even if they're quite complicated, well, you're going to need this code or do this, but you need to be able to reproduce it. Obviously, include any code required, so we're not guessing. Explain what you expected to happen when you did that thing. And explain what actually did happen, you know, what you saw, just in case what we see then is something different with something, you know, like Perch or like WordPress or Expression Engine or whatever, where it's been installed on your hosting, it could be that you've got a hosting problem or a problem with your local environment that's causing the issue. So we need to know that as well so we can actually reproduce it, or if we can't reproduce it, realize that the problem is somewhere else. Ultimately, good support gets you back to your project as quickly as possible. We don't want people to spend a lot of time hanging around in our support system, um, not because we want rid of them, um, or because they're annoying to us, but because if they're in there, they're not working on their project. They're not, you know, working on their business and, and doing what, what they want to be doing. Um, so for us, we want to deal with people as quickly as possible and get them back to their projects uh, so they can have a good experience using Perch. Um, so that's, that's really what all support should be. It, it should be about just getting people back to work with the tools they need to continue. And that's me. Thanks for listening. And my slides and notes and everything will be at that URL later, which I'll tweet. I'm really, really sorry that I am racing off. I agreed to do this after I'd already agreed to do front trends. And Gavin kind of twisted my arm that I should come and said, yeah, not, not the broken arm, yeah, um, so, and, and said that I will have a cab at the, at the door for me to get into. I am getting a flight at midday uh, back to Heathrow to get out to Poland. So I'm really sorry that I'm not around. It's not my style to come speak and run. Um, but do get to me on Twitter or whatever if you've got any questions and things, and, and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? In fact, is anybody a Perch user currently? That's pretty cool. That's cool. Has anybody used support? Are you sure you're not one of those one persons? Yeah. I don't think our 2% is here. <laughs> so I've, I've got a couple of questions. At what point did you realize you needed to move away from email for support? We, we never used email for support. I mean, as a services business, um, we didn't like using email, really, for client communication. You know, we'd rather use base camp or whatever. So I think email is just really difficult, especially when there's more than one of you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having it on a system means that, you know, even if I'm responding to someone, say I'm away at a conference and I've got no Wi-Fi, Drew can look down my thread and make sure that everyone I've been talking to hasn't been dropped because I can't get online. Um, so we, we always knew that we didn't want to use email. It was, it was never really a, a, great, a great idea, I thought. 
So with the support service, HelpSpot, with being that, that being a paid service, and obviously you're selling a service as well, did it, were you having to do support from day one when you launched the service? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I mean, we, we always knew people would need help, you know, people installing stuff on their own sites, you know, it, it, and hosting and things, we always knew we were going to have support. Mm. I, think, I think actually we were more worried about support than it turned out, as I say, you know, from those stats, the support isn't as bad as you think. Um, you know, we, we were always pretty sure we were going to get a lot of people asking questions. You know? Yeah, I mean, just as a, a statement, I, I'm Gavin, I support, um, do a lot of the pre-sales support and some of the basic support at Allbox, who are sponsoring today. Now, some of the questions I get from WordPress to org users are customers who have never touched the internet before. Or you would have thought they would have never touched the internet before. Do you track user or customer types yeah, I mean, and see what type of people they are? I mean, our ideal customer is an experienced sort of web designer or developer, someone who knows HTML and CSS well. If they know HTML and CSS well, they have no bother at all using Perch. So if we could target our, our marketing, you know, just to those people, we'd have an awful lot less support. Because mm. our support is very much weighted to people who, you know, do need that help with, with just the markup a lot of the time. You know, it's like the, the uh, templates are HTML based and they're just having trouble just doing a template, you yeah. know, an HTML fragment. So, you know, if, yes, you, you, it's good to know what your ideal customer is. Because if we could say, oh, well, if we market in this place, we get people who aren't ideal customers, then that's not great marketing to do. Um, but it's quite difficult to work that out just because there's such a range of skills out there, people who are web designers. Yeah. What kind of response times do you try and do it, Perch? We try and get back to people, I mean, certainly within the day, usually within the hour, often within a few minutes. I mean, we, you know, we take it really seriously. We don't want people sat around not able to get on with what they're doing because then they're having a bad experience with the product. Yeah. Whilst you focus on the core use case of the product, do you plan a roadmap for the future and what you, want, what you personally want to do? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, something we were talking about is the fact that it's important that we continue to drive the product, not just sort of think, oh, well, people want this and people want that. Because as I say, you know, there's all these people we never hear from who are obviously happy um, with what we've done and, and the way we're taking it. So, I mean, we do have a bit of a roadmap. We kind of have things we think it would be nice to do. But then that, that is flexible because sometimes you're, you know, you're reacting to responsive design or you're reacting to something that comes along as well. When was the last price increase at Perch? We recently increased first. We, we increased it um, at the beginning of this month, and that was the first time since launch, um, and that was absolutely fine. We, we gave people a month's warning, mm -hmm. because what we didn't want to do, a lot of our customers, you know, obviously they are doing sort of small sites, they don't want to suddenly think, oh, the license is going to cost this much, and then suddenly it's something else. So we gave people a month's warning, we sort of like shouted about it a lot, um, which meant that lots of people bought licenses last month to sort of beat the price increase, which is fine, you know, that's cool. Um, so, but, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were fair to the customers, that they understood, you know, what was yeah. happening and things. And, and the people have been really good about it. I think people like paying for something if they know they get help and it's not going to go away. You know, there's no other plan with Perch. We're not intending to sell it or to, mm. you know, we're, it's just us. We're building a product, we support it, and people pay for that, and that's, that's okay. So with it being pay per license, have you ever thought about somehow introducing a cost system for support specifically? A recurring model over time. No, because I think if you do that, if you have people paying for support, it's in your interest to have support. You know, <laughs> if you're actually earning money for, for, by support, you know, per ticket or whatever, then it's kind of in your interest to have your product hard to use. If support is free, it's in your interest to not have support. So you're thinking all the time, how do I make this product better so people don't need to come into support? If, if you're getting money when they come into support, well, you might as well just sit here and have a difficult to use product that people, you know, yeah. I, don't, yeah, I don't like that model really. Do you track recurring customers? Um, yes, we do. Well, we, we, the people buy licenses in their accounts, so we, we know sort of, I mean, we have people who have, have close to 100 licenses. Um, sort of people who do very similar sites, you know, they do sort of like almost like a template site and they, you know, buy a, a copy of Perch for each one. So we have, we have some customers with a lot of licenses. Um, Was that one person? That, that, uh, the, the one person doesn't have that, but she, she is actually a, a, a sort of a hot head. She has got a lot of licenses. It's not just that she spends a lot of time building one side. But <laughs> so, has anybody got any questions? One? No? Right, because Rachel's going to have to run. <laughs> right, brilliant. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. It's been great to hear you.